of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Hazrat Muhammad Mustafa sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam And I would like to take this opportunity tonight to talk about the special respect that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has regarding the Prophet. Unfortunately, 14 centuries have passed, but the Muslims still do not have a unified opinion about Rasulullah, whether he was just like an ordinary human being or was he something more than that. Do we treat him like we treat one another? Or is his status above that? And the respect that we should accord to the Prophet, is it limited to the time when he was alive? Or does that continue even after his demise? We have to realize that Prophet Muhammad is the integral part of Islam. I wouldn't be wrong in saying that Islam is Muhammad and Muhammad is Islam. You can never think of Islam without Muhammad. And you cannot know Muhammad if you do not understand what is Islam. He is not just a prophet. He is not just a Rasul. He is Al-Mustafa, the chosen one, the most beloved of the messengers of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and therefore Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala actually goes out of his way in the Qur'an to ask the Muslims to show the highest level of respect to him. Inshallah, we'll just be looking at two ayat of Qur'an on this issue. But before that, let me give this the importance that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given to the Prophet. Read the Qur'an from beginning to the end, from Al-Fatiha to An-Nas. 33 times Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands us, 33 or more. He says, Aqimus Salat, Aqimis Salat, Aqimnis Salat, different forms, plural, singular, masculine, feminine. Nowhere does He gives us, gives us the method of Salat. Although it is wajib on Muslims every day. He is basically forcing us to go to Rasulullah. He says the command of salat is from me. The method of Rasul, the, me, the method of salat you have to learn from the Prophet. But when it comes to how to respect Rasulullah, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala goes out of his way. He talks about what is the adab, what are the, what is the etiquette, and the way you should interact with Rasulullah in his life as well as after his death. Salawat Pranayak Barahal. Before I go to the two ayat that I've selected for tonight, let me just give you, an, a, you know, a sense of how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala takes this issue very seriously. Two incidents, which shows that, you know, there were people during the, during the lifetime of the Prophet, who did not treat the Prophet the way he should be respected. However, the Prophet himself was rahmatun lil alameen. He showed his gracefulness by ignoring that attitude. But this is amazing. Rasulullah will show his, you know, helm there. Forbearance in face of those who did not respect him the way he should be respected. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't tolerate it. The Prophet could ignore it, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not turn the other way. He intervenes. Two examples. You know the term Bedouins? Baddu? In Quran, wherever it says Al-A'rab. Al-A'rab is not plural of Arab in that sense. Al-A'rab in Quran means the Arabs who live in the desert, the Bedouins. And by nature, because they live in the desert, they don't have a proper, you know, uh, system like a civil life, they are not that much cultured as far as the behavior and attitude is concerned. So some of them would come from the desert, wherever they dwell, into the city of Medina to meet the Prophet. 
Sometimes they would come actually rich into the city in the afternoon, which is the time when people would be resting. But these Bedouins didn't have this sense of akhlaq and adab. They actually would go to the, day, the door of Rasulullah and see how they would address. They would just say, Ya Muhammad, ukhruj. Even the way of talking to Prophet when he says, Ya Muhammad, and we'll come to this later on. There is another ayat about it. And so they would just say, Ya Muhammad, ukhruj. Again, Rasulullah was kareem. He was haleem. You know, he was very forbearing and kind. He wouldn't say anything. Sometimes he will indulge the request. But this is where we see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala intervenes. Surah number 49, Surah Hujarat, ayat number 4 and 5, he says, إِنَّ الَّذِينَ يُنَادُونَكَ مِنْ وَرَاءِ الْحُجَرَاتِ That those who come from outside the town, and they come outside your, your rooms, يُنَادُونَكَ They shout, call you up. أَكْثُرُهُمْ لَا يَعْقِلُونَ Most of them are senseless people. They don't know what is the right time, what is the wrong time. They don't know the timing, they don't know the etiquette, how to go and meet Rasul Rasulullah. وَلَوَنَّهُمْ صَبَرُوا حَتَّى تَخْرُجُ إِلَيْهِمْ If they had waited until you come outside according to your own timing, people have to wait for Rasulullah. They don't have to call Rasul outside. This is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling. لَكَانَ خَيْرًا لَهُمْ This would have been better for them. وَاللَّهُ غَفُورٌ رَحِيمٌ So he's giving the room that, you know, I am forgiving and merciful. Amend your akhlaq, your attitude when you interact with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. Another example of how Rasul would be silent, showing his karam and hilm. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on that matter, no. He says, Muhammad, you can be silent, I will speak. You know, some there were incidents where the companions would be invited to the house of Rasulullah for dinner. If he had given them a time, some of them would show up before the time. The meal is not ready, but they're already there. So they are waiting. And then the meal has been served. Go. No, they are sitting there, chit-chatting, talking. And this is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala actually realized, that the Prophet actually was not comfortable with that. But he, out of his that sense of rahmatun lil alameen, would not say, okay, go. He would be silent. This is where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah Ahzab, ayat number 53, he says, Ya ladhina amanu. He's giving down the rules and regulations. Adab of, you know, accepting the da'wat of Rasulullah. Namaz, he doesn't say how many rakat. When you go to Rasul, he talks about it. Ya ladhina amanu la tadkhulu buyut al-nabi illa an yubana lakum. O you who believe, do not enter the houses of the Prophet until you have, given, you have been given the permission. And do not go ahead of time ila ta'amin ghayr nazirina ina. Going to the house of the Prophet, waiting there, sitting on you know, the food is being uh, prepared. Walakin idha du'itum fadkhulu. When you are invited in, then you go in. فَإِذَا تُعِمْتُمْ تَعِمْتُمْ فَانْتَشِرُوا Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, once you had your meal, don't linger around. فَانْتَشِرُوا Disperse, go away. وَلَا مُسْتَأْنِسِينَ لِحَدِيثٍ Do not linger around eager for talking. You know this, your, your uh, baraza can be there somewhere else. Not inside the... Um, the house of Rasulullah. No, once the food has been served, eat and khudaf is go. Why? Inna dhalikum kana yuvin nabi. Because when you linger around, 
doing your chit chatting, yuzi from aziyat. The Prophet used to feel un uncomfortable, uneasy. فَيَسْتَحِيِّ مِنْكُمْ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, but he has haya. He is so polite that he doesn't want to say go, but he is not feeling comfortable. وَاللَّهُ لَا يَسْتَحِيِّ مِنَ الْحَقِّ But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, I am not going to be shy here. I will tell you what you are supposed to do. Once the food has been served, go and leave Rasulullah alone at peace. Salawat. <laughs> So this is, this is where you see the, uh, you know, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is reacting to the people who did not respect the Prophet the way, the way he should be respected. They did not have the right attitude and interaction with Rasulullah. The two ayahs that I mentioned, this is again going back to Surah Al-Hujarat, very powerful ayat, and this is what I would like to discuss. Are these, those ayat only for the days when the Prophet was alive? Or are those ayat even relevant to us now, although the Prophet is not among us? The very first ayat of Surah Al-Hujarat says, Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu, la tuqaddimu bayna yadi Allahi wa rasulihi, wa attaqu Allah inna Allah samiyun alim. O you who believe, لا تقدموا Do not go ahead of Allah and His Messenger. واتقوا الله and fear displeasing Allah سبحانه وتعالى. إن الله صميم عليم. Verily Allah is all hearing and all knowing. What does it mean when Allah سبحانه وتعالى says لا تقدموا Do not go ahead of Allah and Rasul. It doesn't mean in the physical sense. Because it wouldn't be applicable to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's not that when you are walking with Allah, don't go ahead of Him. Stay one step behind. Or well, you're never going to walk with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He is a non-physical being. He is a metaphysical reality. So this ayah doesn't mean going ahead in a physical sense. And this ayat, if you say it just means, you know, respect the Prophet in a sense that when you walk with him, stay behind. Yes, that is important. That is part of akhlaq. But this ayat cannot be confined to that physical gesture. Otherwise, this ayat will die after the demise of the Prophet. Because it is only be applicable to those who lived during the days of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So what does it mean when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says لا تقدموا Do not go ahead of Allah and Rasul. The actual meaning here is once Allah and His Rasul make a decision on an issue you as a Muslim are not allowed to go ahead of them and say okay they have said one thing but I have my own opinion. They have said this way, but I have another choice. Allah and Rasul have said, this is what you should do, but I would like to follow my own whims and desires. This ayat then would becomes applicable to the Muslims during the days of the Prophet, as well as to us who have come 14 centuries after him. لا تقدموا, do not go ahead of him. If you know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has revealed a command, if you are sure that Rasulullah had given us instructions, which has come to us from the Ahlul Bayt, and it has been preserved as, as an authentic command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then for me or anyone else in the world of Islam to say, well, I have a different opinion, is actually violation of this ayat لا تقدموا بين يد الله ورسوله صلوات بنا نكبر الله مطبع طباعي the famous مفسر of Quran of this century says that many many of this ayat of Quran has jira jira means they are not static 
These, this ayat would not you know, become obsolete and die with the demise of the Prophet. It still has its own flow. And it will flow in this way. That we are not allowed to go ahead of Allah and Rasul in the issues that they have already pronounced their decisions. Another ayat re, which reinforces that idea is from Surah Azab, ayat number 36. Where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَمَا كَانَ لِمُؤْمِنٍ وَلَا مُؤْمِنًا إِذَا قَضَى اللَّهُ وَرَسُولُهُ عَمْرًا أَنْ يَكُونَ لَهُمُ الْخَيْرَ مِنْ عَمْرِهِمْ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala here is, you know, makes it very clear. Once Allah and Rasul have made a decision on an issue, no believing man well, nor a believing woman has any choice in their issues. It is our problems. But if Allah has decided on it, Rasul has decided on it, we don't have khira, we don't have a choice there but to follow. وَمَنْ يَعْسِ اللَّهَ وَرَسُولَهُ And whoever disobeys Allah and his messenger فَقَدْ ضَلَّ ضَلَالَ مُبِينَ He has indeed obviously gone astray. And so this is where we have to realize that, you know, Rasulullah might have died. And yes, his wafat happened at that time. But his command is still relevant to us according to this ayat. There were people during the days of the Prophet who used to go ahead of the Prophet. Not in the sense of walking. You know, in the eighth year of Hijrah, when the Prophet decided to uh, march towards Mecca, 10,000, you know, well-equipped force was prepared. And Rasulullah started the mar march. This happened in the eighth year of Hijrah in the month of Ramadan. During the daytime, they started the journey. So they were all fasting. Once they reached to a point outside Medina, which we, you know, technically say, had the tarakhus, where a person is now considered to be a traveler, then fasting is not no more valid. That is where even Quran says very clearly. But those who are woman kana and maridan or ala safarin. They will fast the other days. So what does Rasulullah do? He stops there. Asked for water and he drank. And he said that I have broken my fast because I am a Musafir. And I would like all of you to break your fast. Alhamdulillah the majority of Muslims followed him. But there were some. Holier than thou. They said, Yo, we are fasting, how can we break? But the Rasul who brought the Quran, the Rasul who brought the laws of fasting for you, he is telling you, break your fast. They refused. And when Rasulullah was told about it, what did he say? He uses the term Al-Usat. Al-Usat is plural of Asi. A sinner person, sinful person, a disobedient person. These days also we hear, Malana, I'm traveling in first class. Why should I not fast and miss my fast today? Oh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is giving you a concession and you are saying, oh, Allah, we don't want, thank you. This is against the adab. If Allah and Rasul are giving you a concession, you take it. Ibadat and worship is not by what you want. Ibadat means what Allah and Rasul wants from you. You can't say you get up, get up in the morning and you're in a good mood today. You know, yesterday I had a very good business deal, so Allah, I'm going to pray four rakat subah namaz. Would it be acceptable? You can say, I'm, I'm doing four, not two. No, it will be rejected. Because ibadat has to be done the way Allah and Rasul wants from you, not the way you want. Ye mere dil ki baat nahi hoti hai. Ye tumhara dil nahi hai. Agar tum sahi maano mein Muslim aur Mumin ho, to ye dil ab Allah aur Rasul ka hai. Salamat pranay parat.
In Surah Muhammad, Surah number 47, Ayat number 33 that I recited in the khutbah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya ayuhul ladhina amanu atiullah wa atiur rasul. O you who believe, obey Allah and obey the messenger, wa la tubtilu amalukum. And do not make your deeds batil. We are not talking about sins here. We are talking about good deeds. Means don't do it in a way that you are disobeying Allah and Rasul. And this is where we have to realize that the import of that ayat, لا تقدم بين يد الله ورسوله is that even now, even, even though Rasulullah is not present among us, you know, to go ahead of the decision that Allah and Rasul has made would be a violation of this ayat of the Quran. Salawat The second ayat. Again, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking about the adab, the etiquette that Muslims should have when they are in the presence of Rasulullah. The second ayah says, Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu, la tarfa wa swatakum fawqa sawtin nabi. O you who believe, do not raise your voices over the voice of the Prophet. Wa la tajaharu bil qawl ka jahari ba'dikum li ba'd. Nor should you shout at him the way you shout, you know, against one another. This is the house of Rasulullah. This is not the hall of Saqifah. You can do that there, but not here. This is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made clear. Otherwise, what will happen? Otherwise, hapt will happen. Now, what is hapt? I'll explain that later on. But let me ask this question. When the ayat says, do not raise your voices over the Prophet's voice, what does it mean? If we take it just physically, then this ayat becomes obsolete with the demise of the Prophet. It only means that when you are physically in his presence, when you talk, don't raise your voice over the voice of the Prophet. But as I said, the ayat of Quran do not become obsolete. There is jara and flow in that. This ayat is not only for the Muslims who were there, there in the life of the Prophet. Yes, physically they have to refrain from raising their voice over the voice of Rasulullah. But it also applies to Muslims who come after Rasulullah. Even if today, 14 centuries after the Rasul, if I get confirmed statement that this is what Rasulullah had asked us to do, this is his decision on this issue, and if I get total you know, con uh, confirmation from the sources that we have, and now I sit down and say, well, but I don't agree with it. For me to sitting here 14 centuries after Rasulullah came and expressly, ex expressly you know, rejecting the guidance given by Rasulullah is actually raising my voice over the voice of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We might not be able to hear his voice. But if we know by the right sources that this is what Rasulullah said, that is his voice. And if I say, but I have a different opinion on that. I don't agree with it. I am raising my voice over the voice of Rasulullah. I'll give an example. It's not just, you know, rhetoric here. 39 years after the wafat of Rasulullah. Look at the time gap there. 39 years after the wafat of Rasulullah. When his grandson, Imam Hassan al-Mushtaba, died by poisoning. The family decided, based on his initial will, to bury him 
or if not at least to go and do the tawaf of the grave of Rasulullah. But what happened? When the family and the Muslims took the janaza of Imam Hassan al Mushtaba, Ali Marwan and Aisha came in between. They prevented that from happening. There was exchange of very strong words from both sides. There was a po point where Imam Hussain alayhi salam goes to talk to Aisha inside. And there also she was basically very strongly opposing this um, wish of the Ahlul Bayt. And what does, what does Imam Hussain alayhi salam say at that time? He recites this ayat. He says, have you forgotten this ayat? Ya ayuhal ladhina amanu la tarfa uswatukum fauqa sawtin nabi. Do not raise your voice over the voice of Rasulullah. This could be two things, two meanings of Imam Hussain's application of that ayat in that incident. Number one, Rasul, the, the grandson of Rasulullah is reminding Aisha that even though the Prophet is, is dead, but even in the, in the proximity of his grave, you are not allowed to raise your voice. Respect him even after his death. It could also mean that he's saying that there are so many confirmed sayings in the, in the, in the life of the Prophet where he said, Wallah, I love Hassan. Wallah, love the one who loves Hassan. And the way the Prophet talked about Imam Hassan. Maybe that could be one meaning of this application of this ayat where Hussein is saying, by you rejecting and denying this right to Hassan and Mushtaba, you are actually going against the voice of Rasulullah. So when we talk about this ayat, this is not an ayat which has become obsolete. 39 years after the wafat of the Prophet, Imam Hussein uses that ayat. Shows us one way where a people, people can violate this command. And so now also we have to keep our minds very clear about it. Once you are sure this is what Rasulullah wanted from you, if you raise your opinion against it, it is like you are raising your voice over the voice of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Salawat. This is not gunah sagheera Raising your voice over the voice of Rasulullah is a very serious matter. It is one of those gunas and sins which renders all the good deeds of the person as null and void. You know, there is a system with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When you do good things, you will be rewarded. When you do something bad, you will be punished. So you have your credit and debit. But there are certain sins which are so serious and powerful that it will not only affect you and that level. It works like acid where all your good deeds will become null and void. Whatever you have done in the past. And this is known as habd. Let me give you an example. You know, think of the um, kitchen sink. Think of that sink as a container of your good deeds. And water is your good deeds. So you put us, you know, the stopper in the, in the plug area, and then you fill the sink. You do one good deed, two, three, until it is filled with water. So that water is amal saliha, good deeds. But then you do something which is so serious that the impact of this is like pulling off the stopper. What happens to that, the water? Goes down the 
drain. So all your good deeds now went down. One of those sins which I consider to be very serious in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which has that impact, is that all the good deeds done by a person who knowingly, consciously raises his voice against Rasul physically in his presence or, you know, raises his voice against the commands of Rasulullah knowingly and consciously, what it means is that all the good deeds that this person has done becomes haba and manthura. They are gone. They go down the drain. And so this, these ayat, the issue of respecting the Prophet, the decisions of the Prophet, this is a very serious issue. It's one thing to be neglectful, not fulfilling some of the duties, but having this remorse and guilt. But it's something else where you say, I don't agree with this decision of Allah and Rasul. It is this second attitude which constitutes, you know, raising the voice over the voice of Allah and Rasul. And it has this powerful impact that all the good deeds go down the drain. And this is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, لا ترفع سواتكم فوق صوت النبي ولا تجهر له كجهر بعضكم بعض أن تحبت عمالكم Otherwise your amal will become hapt. It will go down the drain. وَعَنْتُمْ لَا تَشْعُرُونَ While you will not even realize what happened. On the day of Qiyamah, you might come there thinking, Oh, I have a long list on my credit side. But you have no shu'ur and realization that you did something that your whole credit became zero. And this is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is so clear about when it comes to how we interact with Rasul in his life as well as after his wafat. Salawat Prande Akbar. You know, a person coming now 1400 years ago, looking at history and can very easily say, so and so person was very generous. He gave quite a lot to poor and needy. He freed the slaves. He provided shelter to widow, widow, widows and orphans. But if that same person commits a serious offense, like right, rightfully taking away the Khilafat from Amir al muminin in Saqifah, or denying the inheritance of the daughter of Rasulullah, then his all charity and good deeds become worthless. This is what we have to realize. That there are certain sins which are so powerful, certain violations of the commandments of, of Islam which are so powerful, if you do that, every other thing that you had done goes down the drain. And so let us have a very clear understanding of what the Quran is saying about interacting with Rasulullah while he was alive and also after his demise and his wafat. Salawat. Khudawand the Alam the Quran me Hukme Namaz Diahe. لیکن طریقہ نماز کو بیان نہیں کیا ہے یہ مثال ہم اکثر دے چکے ہیں کہ ایسی بات نہیں ہے کہ خداوند عالم جو ہے وہ کوئی کتاب لکھ رہا تھا کسی پبلیشر کے لیے اس لیے کہ اگر if you are in the writing business آپ کے جو ناشر ہوتے ہیں ایڈیٹر ہوتے ہیں they put limitations بھائی اس سے you know 500 pages سے زیادہ نہ ہو تو ایسی بات تو نہیں ہے نا کہ خدا وند عالم کو اوپر بھی کسی نے limitation لگا دیئے تھے کہ بھئی اتنے آیات سے زیادہ نہ ہو وہ خدا جس نے مثلا 33 times یا زیادہ حکم نماز دیا ہے ایک ہی بار حکم دے دے تھا کافی ہے 
हज का हुक्म एक ही बार आया है ना और कोई आयत नहीं है एक ही है उसी तरह से नमाज का भी हुक्म एक ही बार दे देता बजाय वो थर्टी थ्री टाइम्स रिपीट करने के जरा नमाज का तरीका बता देता लेकिन नहीं खुदा ने ये नहीं किया क्यों नहीं किया खुदा मंद आलम हम मजबूर कर रहा है अगर हम तक पहुंचना है तो सिर्फ कुरान के जरिए नहीं पहुंच सकते हो हुक्म नमाज तुम्हें कुरान में मिलेगा लेकिन नमाज का तरीका जो है तुम्हें जाना पड़ेगा रसूल से पूछने के लिए इसलिए तो फरमाते हैं सल्लु खमा राय तुमून या उसली कि नमाज उस तरह से पढ़ो जिस तरह से तुम हमें देखते हो नमाज पढ़ते हुए सलावाद पढ़ने एक बार आओ रसूल इस्लाम की अहमियत को बताने के लिए खुदा बंद आलम ने तरीके नमाज को कुरान में नहीं बयान किया मजबूर कर रहा है कि हुक्म यहां से मिलेगा तरीका जाके वहां से सीखो मुसलमानों को जो बर्ताव रसूल के साथ होना चाहिए उसमें भी इबादत बहुत अहम है लेकिन उसमें तफसील नहीं है आदाब जो रसूल के साथ क्या होना चाहिए उसका जिक्र है मसलन सुर नूर की एक आयत है ये जो हमने शुरू में कहा था ये बद्दू लोग आते थे मदीना में रसूल इस्लाम के दरवाजे पे खड़े होकर कहते थे या मोहम्मद उखरुज अरे मोहम्मद निकलो अरे भाई ये तरीका नहीं है यह अखलाक और तहजीब के खिलाफ बातें हैं लेकिन वो बद्दू थे एक लिहाज से उन्हें माफ कर दिया जाएगा लेकिन खुदा सबको बता रहा है कि लेकिन तरीका यह है एक और आयत सुल दें लहतजल दुआ और रसूल बैन कुम दुआ बाकुम बाबा रसूल को उस तरह से मत पुकारो जिस तरह से तुम एक दूसरे को पुकारते हो नाम ले लिया फर्स्ट नाम ले लिया वेस्टर्न सोसाइटी में तो माँ बाप को भी लोग फर्स्ट नेम से ही पुकारते हैं औलाद भी हाँ वो समझते हैं ये बहुत ही ना अपनाइत की बात है खैर यहाँ का कल्चर इनका अपना है लेकिन खुदा वंद आलम को ये गवारा नहीं था जब ये आयत नाजल नाजिल हुई है तब तमाम मुसलमानों ने फिर अब जब रसूल से बात होती थी या मोहम्मद कोई नहीं कहता था सब कहते थे या रसूल उनके ऑफिशियल टाइटल से उन्हें पुकारते थे मुखातब करते थे और इनमें इन, इन आ, इस आयत के नाजिल होने के बाद जनाब फातमत जहरा सलावात जो इससे पहले बाबा को या अबता कह के पुकारती थी बीवी ने भी अब या रसोल्ला कहना शुरू किया एक दिन रसोल्ला खामोश रहे दूसरे दूसरे दिन खामोश रहे कुछ दिनों के बाद बुलाते हैं कहते बेटी हम तरस रहे हैं वो सुनने के लिए या अब अता और जब बीबी ने ये जुमला कहा है कि लेकिन जो आयत नाजिल हुई है रसुल्ला फरमाते हैं ये आयत उम्मत के लिए है तुम्हारे लिए नहीं है तुम मेरी बेटी हो मुझे बाप करके पुकारो इसमें दोनों बात हो जाती है कि भाई उम्मत और आल में फर्क है अहकाम भी नाजिल होते हैं उसका इतलाक जो है डिफरेंट लेवल पे होता है और यही उनवान है जो हम देखते हैं कि खुदा वंद आलम ने इतनी ताकीद की थी कि रसूल के हजूर में अपनी आवाज को बुलंद मत करो लेकिन हुआ क्या रसूल इस्लाम आखिरी नबी हैं आखिरी रसूल हैं इनके बाद कोई और आने वाला नहीं है लेकिन अलमिया तारीख इस्लाम के ये कि रसूल दुनिया से गए हैं गम और रंज के साथ इसलिए कि खुदा वंद आलम की इतनी ताकीद के बावजूद आम लोगों की बात नहीं है खास लोगों की बात हो रही है इन्होंने भी रसूल इस्लाम का एहतराम बाकी नहीं रखा 
सुनते थे अक्सर रसूल से कि जब भी रसूल ने कहा इन तारकुम फ़ीकुम सकलैन दो चीज़ों को छोड़ के जा रहे हैं किताब अल्लाह इतरती अल्लाह की किताब और मेरी इतरत और उसके बाद हमेशा ये जुमला होता था कि माँ इन तमस्त तमस्क तुम बेहि मलन तवीलुबा दी जब तक तुमने इन दोनों का सहारा लिया अपनी हिदायत के लिए कभी भी गुमराह नहीं हो गए ऐलान कर चुका कर चुके थे रसूल अपने फरीजे को अदा कर चुके थे ज़रूरत नहीं थी कुछ और करने की लेकिन फिर भी रसूल इस्लाम ने चाह जब हजरात आए हैं अयादत के लिए जहाँ कुछ घर वाले भी थे और साहबा भी थे रसूल ने सोचा चलो जो हमने ताक़ीद बार बार की है उसको अब कतबी शक्ल में भी दे दें कलम अदवात मांगा और कहा कि कुम हम कुछ लिखना चाहते हैं कि अगर उस वसीयत पर अमल करोगे लम तदिल लुबा दी कभी भी गुमराह नहीं होगे समझने वाले होशियार थे कि रसूल ने ये जहाँ जहाँ ये जुमला कहा है उससे पहले किताब अल्लाह व इतरती का जिक्र है लिहाजा फ़ौर जो है अब आप देखें कि रसूल के हजूर में रसूल एक हुक्म दे रहे हैं एक ख्वाहिश का इजहार कर रहे हैं लेकिन मुकाबले में क्या हुआ आपस में वहाँ इख्तलाफ और आर्गमेंट शुरू हो गए कुछ लोगों ने कहा कि रसूल कह रहे हैं कलम दमात ले के आओ और कुछ लोग सही बुखारी ने लिखा है तकरीबन छः अलग अलग जगह पे सही बुखारी में ये वाक़ मिलता है कि रसूल इस्लाम के बारे में जो ताबीर है आप सोच लें रसूल इस्लाम को कितनी अजियत पहुंची होगी कहीं कहीं तो ये कह दिया गया कि रसूल बीमारी में है तकलीफ में है उनको अब और अजियत मत दो भाई ये तुम्हारा जुमला खुद जो है अजियत है बल्कि उससे बदतर ये है जो रिवायत सही बुखारी में भी है कि नवजुबिल्ला ये जुमला है इन रजुलर कि अब रसूल जो है अपने सेंसेस में नहीं है नवजुबिल्ला यही वजह थी कि रसूल ने उसके बाद फिर लिखा नहीं इसलिए कि रसूल जानते थे कि अगर हम लिख के जाएं तो फिर हमारे अकल पर ये जो है सवाल करेंगे लेकिन इसकी अजियत के वो असर रहा है कि रसूल ने आखिर में हुक्म दिया कि यहाँ से निकल जाओ मेरे बज़म से निकल जाओ आया तो कुरान को ये भूल गए थे रसूल इस्लाम की और तबीयत ख़राब होने लगी घर वाले थे वहाँ थी मारदारी के लिए जनाब सैदा सराने बैठी थी रसूल कभी गशी के आलम में रहते थे कभी अफाका होता था सैदा जो है पहलू में बैठी हुई रो रही थी सराने जब बीबी के कतरे रसूल इस्लाम के चेहरे पर गिरे हैं आँख खोलती आँख खोलने के बाद कहते हैं बेटी क्यों रो रही हो बहरहाल बेटी जो है अपने बाप के गम में रो रही है रसूल ने कहा कि करीब आओ अपने कान को मेरे मुंह के करीब ले आओ कुछ बातें की थोड़ी देर के बाद सैदा के चेहरे पर जो है मुस्कुराहट आ जाती बाद में जब बीबी से पूछा गया है कि बीबी रसोल्ला ने ये क्या कहा था कि जो आपके चेहरे पर मुस्कुराहट आ गई थी पर बात यह है कि मेरे बाबा ने कहा था बेटी इतना गम मत करो इसलिए कि मेरे घर वालों में से पहले शख्स जो हम त, हम तक पहुंचेंगी मौत के जरिए वो तुम ही हो ये सुन के मुझे जो है एक लिहाज से तशफील मिली कि मेरी जुदाई बाबा के साथ ज्यादा तुलानी नहीं रहेगी और वही हुआ रवायात के मुताबिक सत्तर दिन की बात है या नब्बे दिन की बात है बजाखिर में वो वक्त आता है के दरवाजे में किसने दक्कुल बाब किया बीबी फरमाती है कि आने वाले मेरे बाबा आराम कर रहे हैं उन्हें अजियत मत दो 
رسول اسلام فرماتے ہیں فاطمہ تجھے نہیں معلوم ہے کہ یہ دق الباب کرنے والا جو ہے کسی دروازے پر اجازت نہیں مانگتا ہے یہ ملک الموت ہے یہ صرف اس گھر کا شرف ہے کہ وہ اجازت مانگ رہا ہے آخر میں وہ مرحلہ آتا ہے کہ ملک الموت بھی آیا خدا اور رسول کے اجازت سے سلسلہ شروع ہوا امیر المومنین وہی پہ بیٹھے تھے نحجب الاغا میں یہ فقرہ تھے علی کے کہ میں نے رسول کو سہارا دیا ہوا تھا رسول کا سر جو ہے میرے سینے پہ تھا اور میں نے دیکھا میرے سامنے ہی رسول کی آخری سانس جو ہے میرے ہاتھ سے ہوتے ہوئے نکل گئی اور ہم نے رسول کے آنکھ کو بن کر دیا ایک مرتبہ گھر میں وا محمد آ وا مسئیبتہ کی آواز بلند ہوئی ادادار آل حسین علی اور آل آل رسول رسول اسلام کے غسل کفن و تدفین کے انتظامات میں مشغول ہو گئے لیکن دوسرے حضرات اپنے خلافت کے سلسلے میں مشغول رہے اور آخر میں رسول کو گھر والوں نے اور کچھ اصحاب نے مل کے دفن کیا ہے لیکن اس کے بعد عزدار آل حسین یہ آخری نبی ہے جس کے بعد کوئی اور نبی آنے والا نہیں ہے اس کے صرف ایک ہی بیٹی ہے تقاضہ تو یہی تھا کہ مسلمانوں کا کہ اسے جا کے تسلی دیتے اس کو پرسا دیتے اس کے غم میں شریک ہوتے لیکن عزدار آل حسین کیا ہم نے دیکھا ہے اسلامی شریعت میں کہا جاتا ہے کہ جس گھر میں موت ہوتی ہے تین دن تک وہاں دعا نظر نہ آئے مطلب یہ کہ تین دن وہاں کھانا نہ پکے بلکہ ہمسایہ رشتدار تین دن تک وہاں پر جو ہے کھانا پہنچائے ہم لیکن ہم نے تو رج فاطمہ کے گھر پر دعا دیکھا ہے جو دروازے پر آکے لگایا گیا تھا عزدار آل حسین فاطمہ کے بطن میں محسن کی بھی شہادت ہو جاتی ہے علی کی گردن میں رسن باندھی جاتی ہے اس طرح سے مسلمانوں نے علی اور فاطمہ کو پرسا دیا یہاں تک کہ جناب سیدہ اپنے مرسیے میں رسول کی قبر سے مخاطب ہو کے کہتے ہیں سبت علیہ مسائبون بابا مجھ پر اتنے مسائب ٹوٹے کہ اگر روشن دن پر پڑ جاتے تو تاریخی شد میں بدل جاتی عزدار آل حسین جب فاطمہ اپنے بابا کو یاد کر کے روتی تھی ایک وقت آیا کہ ہم سائےوں نے آ کے زراب امیر المومنین سے شکایت کی کہ بی بی کے آہو بکا کی وجہ سے ہم پریشان ہیں انہیں جرہ سمجھائے امیر المومنین نے بیت الحزن کی تعمیر بیت جنت البقی میں کی اور روزانہ فاطمہ حسن اور حسین کے ہاتھ کو پکڑ کے بیت الحزن میں جاتی تھی باپ کو یاد کر کے روتی تھی بس اتنا جملہ ہم بی بی سے کہیں گے بی بی علی موجود تھے بیت الحزن بنایا آپ اپنے بابا کو یاد کر کے جا کے روتی تھی لیکن مجھے ایک اور یتیمہ یاد آتی ہے ایک جب بھی وہ بابا کو یاد کرتی تھی اسے تازیے مارے جاتے تھے اس کے تماشے مارے جاتے تھے عزدار آل حسین بس یہاں علی موجود تھے لیکن ایک اور وہاں بھی کربلا میں علی تھے لیکن آسمان و زمیر کا فخر فخر تھا بی بی آپ پر کسی نے اس وقت بابا کے رونے پر تازیانہ نہیں مارا لیکن ہائے وہ سکینہ جب بھی بابا کو یاد کرتی رہی تازیانے پر تازیانے الالانت اللہ یا القوم الظالمین شیعلم الذین ظلم ایم قلب ین قلبور خداوند اس قریبہ قبول فرما ہمارے گناہوں کو بچ دے ہمارے توفیقات میں اضافہ فرما خداوند شیعان علی جہاں بھی ان کو اپنے حفظ حفظ امان میں رکھ تکفیر یا افواج کو نیست و نابود فرما امام کے ظہور میں تاجیل فرما ربنا تقبل منن نکن تسمین علیم ماتم اوسرک